As Chakravarti introduced, I am the Lava Kumar, and uh, very happy to see so many people on a Saturday morning. Uh, if I was, to be honest, if I wasn't speaking, I wouldn't be here because Friday nights are usually very colorful. I in fact saw one gentleman here sleeping. I'm glad he woke up just in time. Okay, uh, so like I said, I'm a WWE fan, so I uh, you know like to wrestle with uh, web applications, find security vulnerabilities in them develop tools to you know actually fix these vulnerabilities and also talk in conferences and other places so you know you can i can help uh, spread awareness about uh, security in general so this talk is titled everything you need to know about client side code execution which is essentially cross site uh, scripting uh, before i get started i would like to know uh, how many of you are familiar with the concept of uh, cross site scripting pretty much everybody right which is uh, expected because if you are into web application development and if you do not know cross site scripting then you know you you are doing something uh, really really wrong or at least your employer has done done a huge uh, mistake hiring you so everybody does know what is cross site scripting but the depth of understanding of cross site scripting could be uh, you know uh, very different uh, among different people so this talk will and with a lot of technology new uh, features and new frameworks uh, coming over there's a lot of uh, you know changes in the uh, uh, xss space as well both in terms of how xss can happen as well as uh, you know how xss can be mitigated right so this talk is going to talk about all of that so this is the outline so first we'll uh, inter uh, you know like establish what is client side code execution talk about its impact then we will talk about the different forms of uh, different types of client side code execution then we'll look at how to prevent client side code execution because this is a developer conference and you know uh, Uh, prevention or fixing these vulnerabilities is of uh, primary importance then uh, we'll look at uh, uh, you know uh, uh, an online tool called as uh, domgoat it's a, it's a it's a it's a it's an application i've created which can be used to learn uh, dom related security vulnerabilities primarily dom uh, dom related xss issues so i'll show some examples with that you know just to drive home the point okay uh, to get started uh, when we look at security of applications i mean there have been a few security talks yesterday as well so primarily when we look at security uh, people think that security has to be first put on the server you know you have your server side of the application that has to be secured properly uh, if you think of your server side as a very strong and uh, you know a powerful vault or a safe right so what you do is you try and uh, put it behind as many layers of uh, protection as possible you know you have your ids ips firewall and you do all your security testing on the server side and uh, you have different kinds of monitoring systems there so think of it like you know you put uh, put like a really thick wall on your uh, 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 you know vault and you've put a really thick door but uh, for an attacker to actually get access to what is on the server he doesn't necessarily have to break the vault what he has to do is he has to steal the key to the safe if he has the key then he can just open the safe and he can access the contents of the safe right and if you think about it in in uh, web application terms your server side is like the safe and the client side is essentially the key to the safe right because all the data and functionality which is present on the server is essentially accessed through the client side so if you have a vulnerability on the client side then it is equivalent to you know your client side being your key being compromised to the safe so a person can essentially steal all of this data or access all of this functionality without really having to do any hacking as in they do not have to break anything on your server side and uh, again if you think about it 50% of your app is on the client side whereas almost all of your security practices are focused on the server side uh, but on the client side you have a bunch of uh, security problems and in this specific talk we'll be focusing on code execution client side code execution which is uh, cross site scripting okay uh, when we say client side code execution primarily people think injecting javascript into the browser right xss in the name itself you have uh, cross site scripting so the the popular knowledge, uh, you know uh, idea is that uh, you would you the attacker would inject a piece of javascript into my page and then he would do some bad things but it's not just javascript injection you can have html injection and css injection as well and these can lead to different kinds of problems which i'll just talk about So when a attacker is able to inject javascript into your uh, page and he's able to execute javascript in, in in the context of your site on a user's uh, browser 
then they can pretty much do anything your user can do. Essentially, they can uh, take over the user's session, perform actions on their behalf, and they can also try and steal the user's password by using so social engineering uh, techniques. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, you can consider that to be a full compromise of your uh, client side, essentially. And if the user is an administrative user, uh, if his session is being compromised, then, you know, there are a lot of... Uh, much more serious things that can happen because an admin user has access to a lot more functionality on the server side. Uh, let's say an attacker is not able to inject JavaScript, but they're able to inject HTML on the page, right? So this is a limited form of an attack. Uh, in this case, an attacker is still able to do some bad things. For example, they can steal sensitive data from the page. And if the sensitive data happens to be your CSRF token, then the attacker can now impersonate you and they can actually perform actions on your behalf. And uh, depending on, again, what kind of functionality the application exposes, this can be very uh, serious. And again, if I'm able to inject HTML into your uh, site, then I can, uh, you know, write on the trust and I can, you know, uh, perform phishing attacks by which I can steal uh, the passwords of your users. And I can also convince your user into downloading malicious uh, software. For example, if I'm Flipkart.com, uh, hypothetically, and if I'm able to inject HTML into the, you know, the website of flipkart.com, then I can say, hey, this is a big billion day and we are giving you a new, uh, you know, app. You can download and you can run this app. And if you do this, you can actually, you know, book your uh, products faster than you can do from a web interface. And people are more likely to download that uh, EXE, whatever is being offered for download. And because they think it's coming from Flipkart and it, it could actually be from the attacker and it could be a malicious uh, piece of software. Uh, these are some examples of, uh, you know, attacks. You have a dangling markup attack. So these are attacks where a person can inject HTML and they can actually steal sensitive data. In this case, they're stealing a CSRF token. Uh, this is another attack where they are actually changing the, uh, the uh, URL to which a form is submitted. So all the sensitive contents inside this form can get submitted to an attacker's uh, website. Right, and then uh, what if an attacker is able to inject CSS into the page? Uh, he can again steal sensitive data like uh, CSRF tokens, and they can also perform a limited variation of clickjacking attacks. Uh, how many of you are familiar with clickjacking attacks? Okay, uh, some of you. So clickjacking attacks are essentially a form of, uh, you know, uh, uh, making a user think that they're clicking on something when in reality they're clicking on some other part of the uh, page. So you uh, essentially force, trick the user into performing actions that you want them to perform and, you know, uh, while they think they're doing something else. And clickjacking attacks are performed by essentially playing around with CSS on your, uh, uh, you know, site. And if I can inject CSS into your page, then I can perform a limited variation of that and, you know, I can trick you into clicking on different sections of the site which you would normally not click on. For example, there might be a button which says delete my account. Maybe I'll trick you into clicking that account. And uh, deleting a single person's account is not a big deal. But then let's say, for example, you have spent a lot of uh, money in you know, trying to convert visitors to your site into actual users of your application. And then an att attacker is able to inject CSS and he, you know, force, he, he kind of tricks uh, you know, a few thousand people into deleting their accounts. It's a lot of uh, time and investment and money which has been uh, lost, right? Uh, this is an uh, attack called a CSS exfil attack. Uh, this is a technique by which someone can actually steal sensitive data from the page by injecting CSS. So I'm not going to do the details of these attacks. I've put them on the slides. You can refer to them. Uh, but I'm just letting you know that these are, you know, uh, well-established and well-known uh, uh, attack vectors against, you know, uh, uh, for CSS, HTML, and JavaScript. Okay, so now I think that establishes what could possibly go wrong if a person is able to inject uh, any of these three types of data into your page. Now, let's actually see how this happens. How does somebody inject this into your uh, site in the first place? Now, XSS has two variants. One is server XSS. Uh, I think server XSS is the most uh, well-known uh, uh, variant. Uh, what happens here is the server will send HTML, JavaScript, or CSS to the, uh, to the browser. And in this data which comes from the server is controlled by an attacker, right? Now, how does an attacker control the HTML, JavaScript, or CSS which comes from the server? There are two places from which this can be done. Either uh, whatever data goes in the request, the server takes this data and then it puts it back in the response and then it serves it to the, uh, uh, to the, to the browser. 
and if the server is adding this data in an insecure manner so for example if i uh, uh, send some data on the request and this data is taken and then it's added into the html of the page without any kind of sanitation or encoding then you know i can you can actually have attack, attacker controlled html in the response that uh, comes back the other vector is server side storage for uh, this is also called a stored accesses where i uh, you collect data from somewhere it could be from the request or it could be from other places you take this data you put it in a database and then uh, when you're serving a page you take this untrusted data you put it in uh, embedded inside a page in an insecure manner you send it and now you have you know attacker control html javascript or css being served to the uh, browser now this is the most the, the more uh, uh, popular uh, popularly widely known variant of xss but then it is not the most uh, common variant of xss anymore in modern applications this is a talk from uh, christoph kotovitz he is an engineer security engineer at google uh, he has recently found a Uh, or he has at least proposed a solu solution to prevent dom based xss vulnerabilities this slide is from there and uh, as you know google has a bug bounty program which is if you find discover a security vulnerability in google application a, a bunch of google uh, uh, applications then they would actually reward you with uh, you know a good amount of a fairly uh, good amount of money in exchange for the knowledge of the vulnerability and then they'll go and fix this issue so he handles the bug bounty program so he has a knowledge about what kind of vulnerabilities are uh, discovered in google and what kind of vulnerabilities are reported by people uh, on google infrastructure and uh, his observation is that inside google dom xss is the most common variant of xss vulnerability you know just because of how modern web applications are written and uh, this is true for most other modern companies as well unless you are writing web applications like you know people used to write 10 years back if you're using modern uh, uh, you know design uh, patterns then dom xss is 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 the most common type of code execution issue you are likely to have but unfortunately uh, dom xss is not a very well known variant of xss and even those who know dom xss they do not know the depth of you know the different ways in which it can actually happen and in this talk we'll try and look at that okay so in a client xss so when i say dom xss uh, i am essentially talking about or client xss these are inter interchangeable uh, terms so in client xss what happens is you have your javascript engine which you know does a bunch of things and then based on uh, what kind of uh, you know instruction is being executed it will takes data and it will either send it to the rendering engine if you say adding something to inner html or it will send it to the javascript engine again if for example you are doing a set timeout or eval call or it will send it to the css engine if you are you know trying to manipulate the style now if attacker control data comes to the javascript engine right and the javascript engine will take this attacker control data and send it to any of these three places then you will have uh, uh, dom xss vulnerabilities happening on the client side and depending on which engine it sends it to you will have a different kind of an impact you know whether if it's whether it's html injection script injection or uh, css injection now how can dom how can attacker control data actually end up on the uh, javascript engine there are a bunch of different ways in which this can happen you have uh, different kinds of dom properties so uh, these are uh, common ways by which you can actually get untrusted data into your page uh, that is uh, you know your javascript engine can get this data and you have communication channels as well which is you have your ajax calls you have your web socket messages you have your uh, you know cross cross window messaging which is your post message and you also have uh, you know more uh, lesser use but then again th these are you know features available which is your server sent events you have web rtc messages which is essentially your peer to peer communication in modern uh, browsers uh, so these are all places from where you can get untrusted data uh, i'm sure because you're developers you're already familiar with most of these uh, different kinds of apis uh, so the uh, application which i was talking about which is uh, dom goat uh, so this is actually available on uh, online uh, it's available at domgo.at i'll use a local ver uh, version of that so this has a bunch of information about uh, dom xss and uh, it has a list of dom xss sources a source is essentially a place from where you can get untrusted data and uh, the all the different uh, dom property based sources are listed here and their corresponding values are shown now these are called as dom xss sources because an attacker can actually control this value so for example if when this page is loaded 
and in this page if the developer is say for example he is reading location.href then the value of this property can be controlled by an external attacker and the way somebody does it is they can construct a URL and they can send this URL as a link to you say on a chat or over an email and you click on this link and you open the site. Now at this point of time the uh, location.href is essentially the URL of the page and the URL was constructed by the attacker so there is attacker controlled data you know being returned for this particular DOM property right. So similarly you have navigation based DOM properties window.name I think uh, most of you are familiar which is as you navigate between different tabs as long as I'm sorry different between different pages as long as you are in the same tab the window.name property remains the same which is uh, I can say if you visit my site I can set the window.name property and then I can you know automatically redirect you to a different site and then the window.name property will you know uh, will be the same on uh, when it's being read from the other side. Similarly document.refer is again a navigation based source which is I can uh, I can you know uh, have put the whatever payload I want to put in my URL and then I can navigate the person to the to the you know next page and then in that page when they refer to document or referer you know it will have a bunch uh, it will have the payload which you know I had uh, the attacker had actually uh, uh, configured. And uh, communication based sources like I said Ajax uh, responses. Now Ajax WebSocket uh, window uh, cross window messaging these do not necessarily have to be uh, cross site uh, communication which is to say uh, if you are making, so if you are uh, say jsfoo.in and then you make a call to uh, let us say google.com and then you get an Ajax response. So that is cross site data uh, which is this data is coming from an external source which is inherently uh, you know uh, untrusted data. So that is something which an external party can control. But even same site uh, uh, Ajax calls uh, when you make a, a call to your own server and you get the response back even those cannot be considered trusted because you do not know where the server is getting its data from. I will just uh, show an example of that. Uh, so a lot of people think that uh, they do not really have to worry about uh, DOM security because they are an app only company and uh, to be very uh, uh, I think honestly nobody is an app only company if you really think about it because when they say they are an app only company it means the uh, the product that they give to their customers is an app right. But it does not mean that they do not use any web, web applications at all especially in companies like this I would say web security is even more important because uh, think of a company like uh, Ola uh, you know hypothetically and uh, Ola primarily is an app based uh, uh, company I, I do not think anybody uses the Ola portal to you know book anything you all use your apps and uh, the apps are with the users which means the data that they send uh, to the Ola server that is that can be controlled by the users right. Uh, so let us say for example I am trying to book a cab and uh, whatever look and if I am not able to find a cab then let us say this information gets stored in the Ola server so that people could uh, find out in which areas they have hotspots in which areas you know uh, people are not able to find cabs so they can better redirect uh, drivers to those places. And let us say the Ola app sends the look, you know, name of the place to the Ola server saying hey in this place th this user could not find a cab and if I am an attacker what I will do is I will intercept this traffic and then instead of the name of the place I will actually put a you know a piece of uh, HTML and JavaScript and then I will send it forward. This uh, data will get saved on the Google server I am sorry the Ola server and then when an Ola engineer who is sitting inside the Ola network right and when they are looking at their portal to see which areas uh, cabs uh, you know which in which areas people are not finding cabs then that page it, it might make an Ajax call to you know get the list of these places the server will send a JSON which will have a list of these places and then the uh, JavaScript on this page on, on this uh, portal it might take this JSON and let us say it adds it to inner HTML of the page right. Now what will happen is whatever payload the attacker sent from his mobile app will essentially get executed on the portal of an Ola engineer who has a lot of privileges and he is sitting inside the firewall. And I say it is even more important for an app only company because in a, in a company where they have a public face, uh, facing website they usually tend to have uh, you know good web security practices because you know they are they're worried that people might attack them. But in an app based company their security usually tends to skew towards the mobile side. So most of their security engineers might be mobile security engineers they might not have web security experts 
which means whatever internal portals they have, they're, they're more likely to be insecure. And then, you know, someone come from outside, they don't have to do any kind of firewall bypassing. They can directly, you know, try and uh, uh, start stealing data from within your uh, portal. Okay, again, Ola here is, is just completely hypothetical, right? Because it's just a famous app. This has no bearing on the real life scenario in uh, Ola. Okay, uh, now in client accesses, there is an indirect uh, form of accesses source as well, where you have attacker control data which comes to the JavaScript engine. This information will get stored on the client side in, in the browser. So you have different kinds of uh, storing data on the client side. And then in a different section of the site, this data is read from this client side storage and then it is sent to these different uh, you know, uh, 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 engines. So uh, the different kinds of storage uh, you have on the client side, you have cookies, you have local storage, session storage and index DB. And then you also have HTML, uh, you know, uh, uh, element attributes. So, for example, data attributes. So, what can happen is you can get untrusted data. You can then set it as a, a HTML elements attribute. And then in a different part of your, uh, uh, you know, page, this value could be read and then it could be, uh, you know, used in an insecure manner. So, this is an example of an indirect access on uh, Twitter. Uh, so, here... In the URL after the uh, hash part, whatever data was sent, it was actually taken by the page and it was stored. It was on help.twitter. It was saved in local storage. And then if you visit help.twitter.com without the hash, then that page was reading this content from local storage and then it was setting it to inner HTML. Right? So, which meant that uh, you had untrusted data being stored in a, a, a storage mechanism on the client side and then this data was taken from there and then it was executed in a different part of the uh, site. So even if you have, if you're reading data from your, uh, you know, local storage or session storage, then you should consider them as untrusted data because you do not know from where this data is uh, coming originally. Okay, so those are, uh, you know, uh, uh, one way in which you can have uh, code execution on the client side, which is you, ha you have data from an untrusted source going into a sync. Uh, there are other ways as well, for example, malicious libraries and components. Uh, in modern applications, you are, uh, you know, using uh, so many external code. Uh, in fact, I, I would, it would be, uh, you know, uh, not uh, incorrect to say that, uh, you know, there is more third-party code in your application than code written by your own engineers. There are so many libraries which you use for different functionalities and then you have your analytics, you have your advertising, you know, from a bunch of different uh, people and then, in, in, uh, for the advertising and other places, developers don't really have a whole lot of control. For example, these are not so much engineering decisions as they are business decisions. For example, your company might get, do a tie-up with some other advertising uh, company and this, this is decision is taken by some business folks and then, you know, you'll have to embed their uh, JavaScript code into your, uh, your browser. So, there are cases where either these companies are malicious or they are... Uh, uh, insecure, which means they send untrusted data or they send malicious data, which will essentially affect your uh, site as well because that code is executing executing on your site, and uh, you might be embedding third-party content inside iframes and uh, uh, SVG images. Now uh, I'll talk about it in a little uh, detail later. Uh, images are you know usually something which uh, you know you take from external places and embed them in your site, and they can also lead to problems uh, sometimes. This is an example uh, where New York Times, they had, uh, you know, imported uh, JavaScript code from an external party and then that code turned out to be malicious and it was forcing people to, you know, download uh, 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 a virus by, by doing a social engineering uh, kind of an attack. So, and then they had to issue a public uh, statement for that. And uh, with SVG, now usually images are considered to be harmless. Uh, they, they're not executable code. They're just meant to look pretty. And uh, uh, which, which is usually the case apart from SVG because SVG can have uh, JavaScript embedded inside it. And uh, if you think about it, uh, if you're, if you're uh, you know, including a library from an external party, then in, in more mature organizations, you will have a certain process by which you will have to uh, you know, send this through an approval process. For example, there'll be security engineers who will have to look at this code and say that, okay, this library is is okay, you're using the latest version of the library, it is from a popular repository, you can use this library or you cannot use this because it looks to be a little obscure. But for images, it usually doesn't go through this process. Well, most of the time it's not even developers who are, 
you know uh, using images the images come from your designers and you know you just embed it into your site and uh, uh, svg images could have embedded javascript and if a person visits the image directly as in if you put it inside a image tag it's all okay if you were to visit this uh, svg image directly in your uh, browser then the embedded javascript will get executed and it will have you know access to all the client side uh, functionality okay so i think with that uh, i've i've quickly gone through the different ways in which you can have client side code execution from you know what of what are the different places from where you can get untrusted data uh, now let's look at how it can be prevented right uh, how uh, whatever we discuss can be uh, uh, secured against uh, when we're looking at prevention there are four uh, ways in which we can uh, do this i'll go through this one by one the first one is uh, content security policy how many of you are familiar with content security policy okay how many of you have actually applied content security policy on your uh, you know domains okay a uh, few of them that's good now content security policy you can think of it like a firewall for your browser would anybody host your app server or web server without a firewall is anybody brave enough to do that raise of hands without a firewall nobody does that right even if a company is hopelessly uh, insecure they still put a firewall and uh, uh, Hey, uh, does that mean I have uh, less time? You rang the bells. I have fifteen more minutes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, so everybody on the server side, you would definitely put a you know put your uh, server behind a firewall. It's it's the it's the bare minimum you can actually do. And uh, content security policy, you can think of it like a firewall on the client side, which will protect you against uh, you know uh, code execution vulnerabilities. So again. it just makes common sense that you use content security policy on the client side now just uh, uh putting content security policy doesn't just because you put a firewall doesn't mean you know you're good uh, if you put a firewall and you open all the ports on the firewall it's as good as not having a firewall at all right so you put a firewall you'll have to do a little bit of you know common sense based uh, configuration to make sure that the firewall is actually doing something the same way in a content security policy you can configure it so that it at least gives you a certain level of protection you can configure it to make it really secure but then uh, in practical cases at least you can have a, a, a configuration where it gives you some level of protection against uh, you know these kind of issues and uh, if you have to start by uh, you know to protect against the client side then i would recommend you start from uh, content security policy because it gives you the highest uh, return on investment for the time you will actually put in because any other form of protection is a continuous process because you are continuously writing code so you will have to ensure that the code is securely written that it's free of vulnerabilities and so on so whatever process you have has to keep happening you know as you are writing uh, new code but content security policy is something you can put once let's say for example you sp spend a week or two and then you set it up once and as you are writing new code whatever you have already set up the firewall you have set up will continue to give you returns on you know all the new code that you have written let's say for example you write a code after 3 months that has a vulnerability this firewall will still give you, uh, you know, a little bit of protection against that so if you have to start somewhere i'll say you start from here first set this up and then you go and do other things uh okay so again like i said with firewalls the configuration is the key it's about how you configure it not the very fact that you have put a firewall so uh uh the most secure way is in in content security policy you can set a directive which is script src self so this means that uh when your page is being uh, rendered by your browser your browser will essentially ignore all inline javascript so if you have put an event handler in a you know say an elements on click attribute you have embedded, you have uh, you know put some javascript hard coded there or you have the script tag and you've written some javascript code inside it all of that is ignored by your browser the only javascript your browser will execute is script which is loaded with the script src uh, you know directive and this javascript file must be served by your own uh, server as in the domain name must match the domain from which the page was originally loaded right so this means that you have essentially in some ways you have whitelisted which javascript is considered to be you know uh, uh, considered to be legitimate so you're telling your browser hey you only execute this uh, these javascript uh, content 
So whatever JavaScript an attacker injects into your page will get ignored by your browser, right? So it does not execute at all. And uh, uh, if, for example, your, all your JavaScript files, not if, in most cases the JavaScript files are not hosted on your own domain, you have, you have uh, JavaScript code being fetched from or referred from external sources like CDNs and so on. In those cases, what you can do is you can uh, explicitly mention the name of the domain from where you are, you know, uh, you are loading your JavaScript content. And when you do that, try and be as specific as possible. For example, if there's a CDN and all your JavaScript content is inside a specific directory of the CDN, then uh, don't just give the domain name of the CDN because there could be other people who control other directories. So try and be very specific, you know, try and give the path to the exact directory from where you are loading this, uh, you know, uh, uh, JavaScript file. Okay, now uh, the first option is, is probably the most secure. Uh, if you put that in place, then you know, you, you are pretty much uh, taken care of code execution, uh, JavaScript code execution at least. But that's not practical in most cases. Uh, so when you have a scenario where you do have to execute inline JavaScript code, then there are ways to whitelist that as well. Uh, you have uh, the, uh, you know, you have two approaches. One is you can add a nonce. So for the, for the, let's say for example, you have an inline script tag, you can add a nonce to that script tag, or you can add a hash to that script tag. And in the, uh, uh, in the header that's being sent, the content security policy header, you will have to give the same nonce as well, right? So essentially, this, this is a different way of whitelisting. So in this case, you tell the browser, hey, you can execute inline JavaScript as well, only if the inline JavaScript is matching whatever signature I am specifying, right? So this means that an attacker who is able to inject JavaScript, he doesn't have this information. And so he cannot, you know, specify the nonce, and which means his... JavaScript will not be whitelisted and it will not get executed by the server. So, uh, th this way you can whitelist your inline JavaScript uh, code as well. Okay, but what if you have to load JavaScript dynamically, which is uh, you have a, a JavaScript already written and this will at runtime create a new script tag and then it will start loading uh, JavaScript files. So, in this case, what you can do is you can use the uh, script dynamic tag. So, what this does is it will, you know, you, you initially whitelist whatever JavaScript is embedded, hard-coded into the app, either through script files or through inline JavaScript. And after that, you say, whatever other JavaScript which is loaded by this whitelisted JavaScript, I trust that also, right? So it's a transitive trust model. It's kind of like a relay race, which is you give the bet on to the first person and then they can give it to another person and, you know, that is trusted and they can then hand over the trust to, you know, somebody else. So with this, uh, you can still protect against server-side excesses, but uh, this doesn't, uh, you know, uh, protect against client-side excesses. But again, if you have to choose between not using CSP at all due to the way in which you load JavaScript versus using CSP, you can use this so that you have some level of, uh, you know, protection still going on. Okay, now, uh, CSP is very uh, simple in concept, but then again, when you're implementing it, things can get out of hand. For example, you know, you're not just loading external content from one or two domains. For example, there's a CSP uh, policy from Twitter. You might be loading it from a lot of uh, different domains and then it just becomes, uh, you know, too chaotic and whenever your uh, configuration policy becomes very complicated, then you tend to make mistakes in managing them. And, you know, you might uh, have uh, untrusted domains slip into it as well. So, uh, uh, what you can do is you can have a CSP policy, but then have the assumption that someone's still going to bypass it and, you know, they will perform code execution. So what you can do is you can try and use CSP to also limit the level of damage a person can actually do. Like, for example, in a firewall, you can put inbound filters so that a person cannot get into your network. You can also put outbound filters so that if a person does get into your network and they have stolen a bunch of data, then they'll have to get out of, uh, you know, the uh, network as well. And if outbound traffic is blocked, then an attacker is not actually able to take your data and uh, run away. So, uh, these are some ways you can actually, uh, with which you can actually do that. Here, you can say a form action self means you are essentially telling the browser that HTML forms can only be submitted to the same domain. They cannot be sub submitted cross domain. And uh, frames, you cannot load iframes from different domains. And connect SRC is essentially for all your communication APIs. So it says your AJAX calls, your WebSocket messages, and all of that, they can only be made to the same domain, which means an attacker, he's executing JavaScript, he's able to access the contents of the page, but you're making it difficult at the very least for the person to send this data, you know, outside from the page. 
uh, but uh, say for example this was a vulnerability uh, an attack i showed earlier by which a person can actually con uh, you know steal the contents of your html form but with csp this attack will not work anymore but then again uh, like i said csp doesn't mean that your issues are taken away uh, like completely taken care of this for example is a bypass for the same attack again these are on the slides you can refer to it uh, later so the person did a slightly more complicated attack and he was able to bypass the csp directive so even if you have csp uh, pers uh, you know people are still going to bypass it but then at least you make it uh, relatively difficult for them to do okay and then uh, the, the other uh, thing to do is make sure that the vulnerability does not occur in the first place which is you manipulate uh, the dom in, in a more secure manner how many of you are familiar with uh, sql injection vulnerabilities here most of them right so uh, what is the uh, how do you prevent against sql injection encoding okay anybody else parameterized queries right so parameterized queries is the uh, uh, you know is the is the right way to protect against sql injection encoding you might do when uh, your uh, logic is such that you cannot write a parameterized query you know you will have to construct the sql query from a string only then maybe you can use encoding so uh, when you are when you are controlling dom the way in which this particular html element is created it's similar to uh, you know constructing a sql query with just adding strings together and user controlled data and then you send it to your sql api which is a really uh, insecure way to do that instead you can use the parameterized query way which is you can construct the dom more securely which is you use the right apis for doing that instead of just concatenating a string and setting it in your html you can do you know like create element and then you can add the attribute separately and then whatever user controlled data you have to add you can add it to the inner text attribute so that it doesn't get treated as html and uh, with this you probably have performance uh, benefits as well i'm a security guy so don't quote me on that but i would assume uh, you know uh, that would be the case okay and uh, like with sql injection uh, if there are complicated scenarios where you cannot use parameterized queries and you will have to construct the sql uh, you know query from strings similarly in your dom as well there could be scenarios where you cannot construct the dom that way or you have a lot of legacy code where they're just you know adding strings strings together and they're adding, setting it to another html you cannot just go back and rearchitect everything i don't think your manager is going to approve that so uh, in places like that what you can actually do is you can encode the data before you add it to the uh, you know string so there are uh, uh, well tested libraries available for doing this you have isapi for js you have the jquery encoder plugin these are libraries which have been written by the security communities and they have been extensively tested by the security community as well so you can uh, you know uh, you are you are you are in very good hands using these uh, libraries so they have different kinds of methods now when you are doing encoding uh, encoding is very uh, you know context uh, specific it, you can think of it like you know speaking to somebody like for example if uh, uh, you are from tamil nadu then i i can speak to you in tamil it will make sense to you but if you are from karnataka i speak to you in tamil then you know uh, you might uh, it might just sound like gibberish to you so when you do encoding you will have to encode it for the proper context otherwise you are not really doing much in terms of security so depending on where you are putting this data for example if it's going to go into the place of a url you can you can encode it for url context if you are going to put it inside an html attribute you can encode it for html attribute context and so on now here even though you have the ability to encode for javascript and css i would still recommend against doing that uh, try and see if you can design your application differently so that you never have to essentially you know put a user encoded data directly inside a, a script tag for example instead of uh, uh, putting something inside the script uh, tag what you can do is maybe you can put it inside a data attribute and then from the script tag you can read this data attribute element so you can do a html attribute encoding put it in a data attribute in some other element and from the script tag you can read that value of the data attribute rather than you know embedding it directly inside the script island okay and uh, for the malicious li and vulnerable libraries what you can do is you can ensure that your libraries are up to date you're not using any outdated libraries these are very common uh, uh, you know uh, best practices and if you are uh, going to use an external library right let's say for example there is a, there's a fu certain functionality you need you found this in one library which was written by somebody some 6 years back 
and uh, you know uh, it has not been maintained after that you do not even know this person you know you, you don't know if this library can be trusted but the functionality is very uh, is very unique and you actually need this functionality in your uh, in your application let's say so what you can do is rather than include that library into your uh, you know uh, uh, into your page using a script source what you can do is you can create an iframe and you can sandbox this iframe which means the iframe has very limited uh, access it cannot access your dom and you can load the script element inside this iframe okay and you can expose it like a library so you can have a cross window messaging where you can take the user you can take the data you can call and you know send a message to that iframe the iframe will call that library do whatever action it has to do the results can be sent back to you using a, you know a cross window message so this way you are using that external library as well at the same time you are not exposing the contents you know to that library so think of it like uh you know you have random people walking on the streets and you want to talk to them it doesn't mean you directly take them into your uh, you know room and uh, like house and give them full unrestricted access what you will do is you will probably take them to a coffee shop or something and you will do your discussion so you know this is similar to that you put them in an iframe and then you know you do your transaction through a, a cross window messaging and uh maybe once i finish this you know, we can do that uh and uh, sub -re sub resource integrity which is if you are if you are loading external uh, resources you can use sub -re resource integrity by which you can give a signature for this resource and if that domain which is serving this resource gets compromised and then if uh, the an attacker is able to change the contents of that resource your uh, you know browser will not load it because it fails the integrity check and finally for svg images uh uh serve them from a se separate domain if possible so that you know the javascript doesn't have access to this uh, domain's contents and uh, set an S uh, csp header so that you disable all inline javascript and finally if you if both those things are not options the least preferred option is you can set the content disposition header to attachment so that if somebody visits this svg file then it downloads onto their site or onto their uh, laptop instead of you know rendering on the page and executing the javascript right so with that uh, i have come to the uh, end of the uh, session i do not know if i have time for q and a i'll let uh, yeah, there's a join q and a okay perfect okay uh, thank you guys so that was that was all i had thank you